just joining us, please feel free to jump in, uh, drop your name um, and where you're from uh, in the chat this evening. Uh, Kelly and Jason, nice to see you joining us all the way from Utah. We miss you up here um, in East Glacier. So again, my name is Peter Metcalf. We'll go ahead and get started here. I'm sure some more people will be joining us as we go. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance. I'm really grateful to have all of you here with us this evening uh, for the fall gathering. Thank you for your flexibility as we've had to navigate this COVID pandemic and make some changes um, over the last weeks and the last day to our ability to gather uh, together as this pandemic continues to surge out of control right now in the state of Montana. And um, we really uh, appreciate, I wanna say right off at the beginning, uh, the leadership of former Governor Bullock and Greg Holtzman and everyone um, at the state uh, earlier in this pandemic and particularly the, the tribal council that's worked so hard to try to keep our local community safe during this time and healthy. And um, as it resurges in really amazing ways, um, we really wanted to make sure that we as the Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance did our part not to contribute to spreading the disease here in the community or to uh, further shut down of the reservation. And as I said last night, I'd also like to take a moment right now at the beginning just to recognize all of our healthcare workers uh, in our hospitals in particular who are um, on the front lines every day with this pandemic. And to know that we are, are grateful for your, your commitment and um, we, we uh, support you and we're concerned about you and we just are, are thankful for the work that you're putting in out there. Um, and to anyone who's suffering um, related to the, the pandemic, you know, I know there's been a lot of trauma for different folks. Know there's help and resources out there. So please uh, know you're not alone and that to avail yourself of those. So, but tonight we didn't come here to talk about that. We came here to celebrate the glorious Badger 2 Medicine Country and uh, to come together as a community as we do every year this time. This is our 12th annual fall gathering. Now our second virtual one. Um, to celebrate the Badger 2 medicine, to learn more about some of the conservation issues and cultural issues that are related um, and tied up into this landscape and to the larger effort at uh, maintaining uh, healthy and vibrant communities, both wild communities and human communities here in this part of the crown of the continent. And that's what we're gonna do tonight. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Glacier 2 Medicine Alliance, we're a grassroots conservation organization uh, based here in East Glacier uh, that was founded in 1985 mostly to remove oil and gas leases from the Badger 2 medicine. Um, we work predominantly on conservation and management issues related to that area, um, fish, wildlife, uh, public lands. And the Badger 2 medicine, of course, is uh, also the cultural homeland and part of the traditional territory of the Blackfeet Nation. In addition, because no land is an island, we work um, on some other surrounding areas of the Flathead National Forest and Glacier National Park on lands and water. Um, and fish and wildlife management issues in areas that were part of the traditional territory, not only the Blackfeet, but also the Salish and the Kootenai. And so I'm excited tonight, both for tonight's uh, gathering with Governor Bullock, but as well as what we have coming up down the pike this week. Um, we have, hopefully you joined us last night for Dr. Christina Eisenberg as she spoke about TEK and Western science. We'll have a recording of that out later this week if you missed it. And of course, uh, coming up tomorrow, we have hikes here um, in East Glacier at nine o'clock that you're welcome to join us for into the Badger 2 Medicine. And then we'll have documentary films on Wednesday. I'm very excited, both of them are short and deal with bison uh, in different ways. Um, one, the effort to restore bison here um, locally led by the Blackfeet as part of the Ami Initiative and the relationship between wolves and bison on Ted's Turner Ranch out of Bozeman. And both were shot by Daniel Glick who made our refuge. And both he and Willow Kipp, who is the Indian Initiative Coordinator, will be joining us for that on Wednesday. And then next Friday, we wrap up this wonderful fall gathering with Dan Carney, um, who many of you know, uh, former Fish and Game Director for the Blackfeet Fish and Wildlife, and a grizzly bear uh, expert who will talk to us about grizzly bears, and then we'll count down the end of our live auction. So it's going to be a great week of celebration virtually, and we're uh, just really glad that you could join us. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Holtzman, the former um, public, uh, I actually don't remember your title, Greg, but he was the head of the public health department for the state under uh, Governor Bullock and our founder and uh, current uh, vice president, Lou Bruno, uh, to introduce tonight's speaker. And before I do, I'll just say during, um, at any time we have some questions for Governor Bullock, 
please throw them in the Q&A portion at the bottom of your screen and we'll have some time to get to those afterwards. So without further ado, uh, Greg and Lou. Thanks, Peter. So uh, I, I was the state medical officer. And uh, so some of you may or may not know me, but uh, I worked with the Governor Bullock since 2015 uh, and got to know him very well over the last year yeah. with the COVID pandemic. And there's a lot I can talk to you about Governor Bullock and say a lot of very uh, wonderful things about him. I, I truly think very highly of this man. Um, I always, as I said, thought highly of him as a governor, but getting to know him very well during the last year as an individual, as a leader, but probably most importantly, as a kind of caring and compassionate human being, um, just the amount of care that he put into everything uh, that we were working on and addressing. And obviously COVID was uh, intense, but also working on other things from e-cigarettes to um, the tobacco issues, the Medicaid expansion. And although I very much strongly uh, support all the cons um, conservation uh, that work that's been going on, I got to say that I'm not the one that keeps up with it super well. So usually when I would come up to visit or be up in East Glacier in our home, I'd usually hear from Lou what was, we, what was happening right and what was happening wrong. Uh, and all the other things that are going on from the federal government uh, on down. And so I would hear a lot about the positive things. A lot of it was on defense these last four years, um, but that the, govern, uh, the Bullock administration and others were doing, I knew the hard work that Governor Bullock has done on uh, our public lands and also a lot of the work on uh, addressing some of the issues with William Perry when he was appointed or yeah, appointed, never confirmed uh, at the uh, federal level under the Trump administration. But to really tell you about what, what Governor B uh, Bullock's background in that area, I'm gonna hand it over to my friend, Lou Bluerno to uh, give an introduction of Governor Bullock. Yeah, well, there's so many things uh, that I could talk about. Uh, uh, of course, the thing that mostly affects us is the thing that Gov Governor Bullock did over uh, William Penley Perry. Uh, basically, he was a, a political appointee. Uh, they appointed him as, uh, as a, a basically a te temporary uh, so, that he, so that it wouldn't have to be vetted by Congress. And, uh, and Steve initiated uh, uh, a suit uh, based on the fact that uh, anything that Penley did because he was a Department of Interior had uh, was null and void. And a judge ruled that that was so. That was just one of the things. But for years, uh, Steve has been uh, an advocate for keeping public lands in public hands, these, these lands that we absolutely love. And we thank him for that. And, uh, and for years he's done things, he's kept these crazy bills from coming out of the state house and being, becoming law. And he was always the stopgap that kept it from happening. Uh, so we knew when he left that it would be bad. We didn't know how bad it actually has become. And now we are seeing it. And thanks to Steve, it didn't happen until now. So thank you very much for doing all of that. And we hope that, that uh, you know, the courts will, will uh, undo some of those laws that came through the House and Senate. So take it away, Steve. <laughs> Glad to have you. Thanks so much, Lou. Uh, thank Doc Holzman, um, and thank you, Peter. And it really is a, both an honor and a gift to be here with you this evening. I recognize that we would all much rather be gathering in person to uh, celebrate, commiserate, and recommit. But I do so appreciate all of you spending a little bit of time on your Saturday night uh, with all of us in fellowship. You know, when I asked my friend, Dr. Holzman about what I should talk about this evening, um, I threw out several potential topics, uh, public lands, conservation, or the year that I spent more time speaking to my medical officer 
than my wife during a global pandemic. And while providing a blow by blow account of that uh, might be riveting to Doc Holzman and me, probably no one else. And I also fear it could also cause a little bit of PTSD. So instead, I wanna talk a little bit tonight about what makes this area, and I, my daughter was playing uh, volleyball in Kalispell, so my wife and I are up here in East Glacier uh, as well, but what makes this area so special and indeed what makes you all so special? I still remember almost like it was yesterday moving into the governor's residence in Helena. It was a place that I had regular access to as a kid or at least the front steps, because I delivered newspapers to it as a child. Uh, but there's a place that also filled me with awe, and it, not because of the architecture or the building, because, but because it represented the improbable journey uh, that led me to that position. When we moved into the governor's residence, our children were six, eight, and 10. Um, the youngest kids to be part of the bubble of serving in the role of governor in over four decades. In the living room, it's an area that they call the state room. There's this massive painting by John Ferry of Chief Mountain. And I don't think we we're uh, even a week into living at the residence when our youngest, Cam, he kicks a soccer ball, um, it bounces off of Chief Mountain. The residence manager, in an ever so respectful tone, said something to the effect, uh, well, Governor, that painting's worth $100,000. And I replied, well, then we're going to have to take all the damn paintings down because a six-year-old can't be expected to live in a museum. Now, parenthetically, I think what happened is that they went to the Historical Society and determined that if Chief Mountain or any of the other art was damaged. It would just become part of the history and the story of that piece of art. <laughs> Luckily, the Bullocks made it eight years, though, without adding such a chapter to Montana's history books. But I think that experience, though not publicly disclosed at the time, served as, in some respects, as the foundation for my first day of the state address. I'd said at the time that any change of administration naturally brings change to the governor's mansion, change in substance, style, and perspective. And with the Bullocks moving into the neighborhood, some of that change is unavoidable. It's been 40 years since the predominant noise emanating from the governor's mansion has been the sound of young children, children playing, laughing, just being kids. That noise will be a daily reminder to me, and I hope to all of us, of the reason we're sent here. Montana's voters sent us here to make our children's and grandchildren's future brighter, more hopeful, and more prosperous in the state of Montana. And I closed with the admonition to the legislators and other elected officials, at the end of any one of our terms, um, yours or mine, we will be measured by the progress that we made. And the true measure will be taken not by the politicians or the pundits, but by our children. Let us not forget that it's to them that we are most accountable. And I start with that because what I tried to convey uh, during that first address is exactly why you gather, why you do the good work that you do. The vision of Glacier Two Medicine Alliance your vision statement, it's not rooted in the battles of yesterday or the challenges of today. It's about what we can all offer to those who follow. The vision statement is, quote, a child future generations will recognize and can experience the same cultural and ecological ri richness that we find in the wild lands of the Badger to Medicine today. And your mission and mine, we aren't as unique as perhaps one might think. The notion of th leaving things as good or better than that we found them, it really is the promise of our public and our wild lands, and indeed it's a promise of our nation. Over a century ago, in 1910, Theodore Roosevelt counseled, of all the questions which can come before this nation, 
Short of the actual preservation of its, of its existence in a great war, there's none which compares in importance with the great central task of leaving this land an even better land for our descendants than it is for us. Unlike no place in the country, I think that folks in Montana and folks out West have a special appreciation for our public and our wild lands. We know that our public lands are our heritage, their birthright, they're a great equalizer. I mean, it doesn't matter the size of your checkbook or who your family was or what you might own, that our public lands and access to them are for everyone. And we know that every American has an equal ownership stake in public lands. We're blessed to have so many of these national treasures surrounding us in Montana, but these lands belong to the entire country. And while these lands might be equally owned, the economics they generate belong to us. The fight to preserve and protect our public lands and our wild spaces is not just an historic one, it's an economic one. They're the obvious economics of tourism and a thriving outdoor recreation economy. During non-COVID years, uh, we have nearly 13 million people visit Montana. And they ain't coming for our Walmarts. They're coming to explore our wild places and our quiet places. Montana's outdoor recreation economy delivers over $7.1 billion in annual consumer spending, employs over 71,000 people each year. It's a major economic force for our state. And people want to live and work and raise families in Montana, in large part because of our wild lands and our public lands and those wild places. But what makes us, I think, even that much more special out West, our lands are part of the traditional family values we pass down from generation to generation, just as our grandparents and parents did for us. Our children and our children's children will know what it's like growing up watching the stars. I have no doubt that everybody on this conference this evening have had incredible memories or unforgettable stories from adventures you've had in the Badger Two Medicine or other public lands. I think back to my own life, the first date I went on with my former high school classmate that became my wife, Lisa, it was a picnic in the South Hills of Helena, minutes from what's now our front door. The first summit my three kids begged uh, was Mount Ascension, a part of the open space preserved by land trust, also right on the edge of Helena. I'm fortunate to take my son Cameron hunting on our public lands nearly every year, often successful in downing a buck. And the first major, well, I'll say a mega hike I took with our three kids uh, and Lisa wasn't with me at the time or on that trip, but it was to Iceberg Lake. Yeah, we stopped every five minutes for a candy break or to fill our mouths with huckleberries. But like it was yesterday, I still remember the sense of awe and joy, not just in swimming in that freezing cold lake, but along every step of the way. And whether it's falling in love on a picnic while on a trail hike, your kids first summit climb, an unforgettable hike. These are the memories that shape and define us as Montanans and for so many of us as Americans. Those before us had the foresight to maintain our history, our outdoor legacy, the memories that define us. They knew what we know now, that setting lands aside for the public's benefit is one of America's greatest ideas. And it's an idea that can and must survive generations. Now it's up to us though to pay it forward and to make sure that future generations have the opportunity to wander, to contemplate, to create lifelong memories on our prized public lands and wild spaces. But make no mistake, our public lands are under attack. And along with it, our clean air, our clean water, our wildlife, and the very values that define us out West. There are those who are actively working to erode our parks and our forests and undermine access. There are individuals and in corporate interests that want to try to transfer or sell off 
our public lands, or even to this day, extract oil and gas from the Badger II medicine. It wasn't that long ago that the prior administration finalized plans to open up two of Utah's national monuments for drilling and mining. Recognize that was the largest elimination of protected public lands in US history. Acting in defiance of over 100 years of history, of 16 presidents designated 157 monuments, dating all the way back to 1906, when Theodore Roosevelt first used the Antiquities Act to protect Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Sure, maybe the only good thing to come out of all of that was the cancellation of the oil and gas leases in Badger II Medicine. But not even that victory made those actions less bitter because an attack on Utah's public lands or any public lands is an attack on all of us out West and all across the country. An attack on public lands anywhere is that attack on public lands everywhere. And it flies in the face of who we are as a nation. At the same time that Washington's chasing its tail, we are also, we're undergoing profound changes in our region impacting traditional jobs and energy sources that have powered our economy and the very environment and climate around us. In Montana, our temperatures are three degrees warmer on average than they were just a few decades ago. This past July, 2021 was the hottest month globally in recorded history dating back over 140 years when we first started keeping global temperatures. Across the West, early spring runoff is impacting our water availability, causing flooding. Prolonged drought and early winters are exacerbating the unpredictable environment and the trade environment for our farmers and ranchers. Our fire seasons are, by some estimates, 78 days longer than they were just 30 years ago. And by most accounts, they're more severe. I think back in 2017, not only did we have the largest fire season on record in Montana since the big burn of 1910, we had the most expensive fire season on record. We had double the incidence of respiratory related ER visits in affected counties. We endured periodic waves of evacuations and tragically, we lost the lives of two wildland firefighters. That year alone, the state lost up to 200,000 visitors due to those fires and smoke, resulting in a loss of over 240 million in visitor spending. Yet there are those that, who want to deny that our climate's changing before our very eyes. There are those who want to choose inaction, who purposely sideline us in gridlock instead of making the change that we need to move forward. And so many of the challenging issues that we face as a region Citizens of the Rocky Mountain West were uniquely capable of collaborating to find shared solutions. You know, one of the greatest uh, joys of the job that I got a hold for eight years was the opportunity to try to bring diverse Montanans spanning industry, hunters and anglers, conservation groups, working landowners and local officials in service of solving some of our most, more difficult policy challenges like developing a plan to protect the greater sage grouse from an Endangered Species Act listing, or advancing efforts to further the restoration and management of our national forests, or developing a plan for our state to prepare for and respond to global climate change, a plan which unfortunately right now, I think is shelved. Nonetheless, I do have tremendous faith in the capacity and values of our region citizens. In this time and age of political polarization, our turn to shared values and our work to conserve our region's nat natural heritage and public lands is precisely what we need to chart a path forward. Indeed, as I said, it was over a century ago when Theodore Roosevelt gave us that great central task of leaving this land an even better land. Today, we know that that task does face continuing threats. And don't kid yourself, those threats to our public lands are real, but with every threat comes that greater duty and responsibility to ramp up our focus 
on protecting these natural resources. It's responsibility that we share together and one that we must do together. And indeed, it's responsibility that we're recommitting to here this evening. It's also up to us to do much more than just playing defense. We often hear that all politics are local. Take that one step further. And you can realize that at times, politics are deeply personal. As I alluded to earlier, mine is a lifetime of memories forged by a landscape of Montana. It only makes sense that when Lisa and I choose to raise our three kids in Montana as a result and give them the same remarkable experiences in childhood that we had. And I know mine is a story told over and over again. So when I see moves to take away our endanger, our public lands, in our wild spaces. It's not political for me, it's personal. It's hard not to believe that we face some of the most difficult tests of our time. They are tests we can't afford to fail. Tests that will determine whether the sub subsequent generations will be able to experience places like Badger to Medicine or the Rocky Mountain West and all it has to offer, just like we're able to now. But being here this evening, with you gives me hope that we will not fail. For over 35 years, the Glacier Two Medicine Alliance has been fighting to protect and preserve the sacred area. And a gathering like tonight is a celebration, yes, of what's been accomplished, but it's also recognition that there remains much more to do, and it's also an opportunity to recommit, to recommit ourselves doing everything we can to protect to preserve and promote our national treasures. So thanks for all the work that you put into just over this last year since the 11th celebration. Thanks for the work that you've done over the past 36 years. And thank you for the work that you'll continue to do in the future. I thank you, but of greater significance, my kids thank you. And with that, I'd be happy to answer, I think almost any question. Thank you, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Governor Bullock, for that uh, sharing those thoughts with us and for that story and that reminder of both how important um, public lands are to Montana, um, to our shared heritage, and uh, to our economy and to our future, as well as that challenge and obligation and responsibility we all have to help ensure that we can pass along that legacy um, to our children or to our uh, friends or family's children. For those of us who don't have kids and that those generations that come, come after us. Um, one of the questions I think I'll get us started here with that we uh, had the opportunity to chat a little bit about um, at, at dinner tonight is I think, you know, as you talked about, it's pretty clear that Montanans of all stripes and particularly people from around the country as well, one of the things they value about this place is the abundance of of undeveloped lands, both those that are in federal ownership as well as state or um, private, but particularly thinking of public lands in this case. And of course, our abundant wildlife populations. I mean, we are kind of the envy of the nation in many ways uh, for the, the abundant wildlife and, and the diversity that we have that has gone, um, been well managed by FWP for many years. And so I guess my question is this, we've seen in the, and since your time in office, you know, you as Blue alluded to play defense on a lot of bad wildlife bills, at least from a conservation standpoint, particularly around bison. Um, and we've seen even more, you know, of those get passed through now in the latest administration. Why do you think it is that um, we, that conservation is, is facing such a backlash in the in kind of state politics right now? And, and where can we start to, you know, push back against that in our current political climate effectively. Yeah, and, and Peter, I think that conservation is facing a backlash among certain elected officials, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily, look, in some respects, part of what got and kept me in office was a coalition of people that cared about public lands. They might not agree on all issues, but you could be a fly fisherman, a bait fisher, a snowmobiler, or a hiker. 
that they knew that these lands were threatened. And they also knew that I would stand up and make sure that they stayed there. Now, I think in some respects, we collectively have done such a good job in that area that a lot of people don't think that public lands are always threatened from transfer or further degradation. So we've got to make it real. I think we also have to, and that's the same with public trust wildlife, right? Um, not only do these public lands provide incredible opportunities, but the block management program is the largest private land conservation and hunting program in the country. Right. I think we also though, always have to make sure that, um, as I had mentioned at dinner, if you can't make it to the end of the month, it's a luxury to think about the end of the world with climate or some of these issues that we deal with in conservation. So we've got to make ensure that it is accessible to everyone, that people understand what's at stake and people understand that um, this isn't an either or, an either or being creating a robust economy or protecting public lands. I mean, that's one of the reasons why we started an office of outdoor recreation to make sure that people understood that this is one of the big economic drivers in our state. And there's, heck, there's a lot of things to be discouraged about right now, but I don't think you, me, or anybody on this has the time to be just discouraged and despondent. We have to continue to make sure that every Montanan without regard to their political stripe, understands that they are conservationists because the land and the wildlife and the waters are deeply imbued in who each and every one of us are. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, you talk about bringing groups together to solve some of these policy challenges and obviously things like wolves and bison and bears get a lot of the attention because they're the most divisive, but in your experience, um, maybe on the campaign trail for Senate or in, in office, are there particular issues that you see right now are ways that are good for kind of building those coalitions um, that could have, you know, maybe larger, broader impacts but are ways of bringing, bringing people together that may, you know, represent some of the older coalitions that you, we've talked about in the past, you know, uh, of interests that don't just cleave along more current partisan lines. No, it and it takes hard work. Like I think of, you know, and I mentioned it briefly, <clears throat> we did a climate solutions council that had everyone from conservationists to oil and gas. We forget that of the 60 recommendations, like 50 of them were unanimous. Mm -hmm. um, we did a, had a council that dealt with grizzly bears and grizzly bears on the landscapes. Now, in some respects, you know, I'd, I'd said when I was first running for uh, governor, there's two ways to become a wildlife biologist in Montana. One is to go to U of M, get your master's, and the other is to run for office, right? Because yeah. all elected officials seem to want to run, manage wildlife. But contentious issues, I mean, I'm convinced if you can get the right people around the table, no matter what it is, and if as so we do that from the bottom down, it can make an impact up. And it expands sort of the coalitions and the understanding that we have. I mean, my view was always um, in running for office that, you know, most people's lives are too busy to care about politics. But everybody wants a safe community, roof over there, clean air, clean water, public lands, good public schools, the belief you can do better for your kids and grandkids than what was done for you. Mm -hmm. And if those are the values we try to unite around, um, notwithstanding just this deeply toxic sort of national polarized time, that I think that we can build and expand our bases and our understanding rather than further limit them. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want to ask a couple more questions here before we get to the, the questions that are coming in to the to the Q and A, and I encourage folks uh, to get your questions in into that Q and A now, please, um, or as they come up. But um, 
you know, thinking about wildlife for a little bit longer here, uh, one of the things that you know, species that you were really instrumental in both helping to expand some of the conservation spaces for, as well as advance opportunity for, um, and that being managed by tribal nations was, was bison. And we still have a long ways to go in this state, obviously. We, we barely, barely don't have a wild bison herd, at least that is a permanent resident in the state of Montana. Um, but here, are, you know, on the Blackfeet Reservation, the Me Initiative and the Blackfeet have been doing you know, taking steps as have other tribal nations such as Fort Peck and Fort Belknap to try to move forward towards some sort of model of, of, of bison restoration. And efforts have often been thwarted by at the state policy level um, in terms of transferring bison from, you know, across jurisdictions and stuff. Um, and I was wondering what you, you know, and we saw probably the most strongest um, anti-state wildlife bill that I know has been passed recently in terms of counties being able to make a decision over bison transfer in this last legislature. But overall, the, the trend line in recent years has been more towards, you know, greater opportunity for tribal nations to take a lead on bison restoration. And I'm just curious what you see right now in that regards in terms of where are we, you know, where are we going and where are the opportunities that you think might be um, coming that would help further the project, the progress that has been made uh, in terms of tribally led bison restoration in the state of Montana. Yeah, I, I guess two things, Peter. One of which is, you know, when we expanded the tolerances for bison um, outside of Yellowstone Park, once it was done, there was nary a complaint. Right. Like it didn't cause havoc to anything and for all that it took to get there um it worked so i think when we make steps forward people recognize i hope people recognize and realize the boogeyman that you all want to make it didn't necessarily um materialize and i do think that we've seen such uh, not just on the Blackfeet Nation, uh, Fort Peck Nation mm -hmm. is another one. Um, you know, we've seen such great examples of building genetically pure and wild bison in our tribal nations that even from my time in office when uh, Governor Schweitzer at the tail end transferred a few of them that I don't remember if they'd come from the Turner world or the park, but to where we ended, there was much greater tolerance and acceptance. And it's not without hard work, but I'm hoping we're getting on a path where, um, especially with our tribal nations, it'll be that much more accepted. One of the things that you point out, which I think really is concerning, it's a bill that I vetoed multiple times. No county, like <laughs> the North American model, right, of wildlife is these are in trust for all of us. Right. And none of us own these animals. Right. And no county commission should be able to actually set the dictates of what happens with wildlife in their respective county. And it's something that we just have to keep bringing up. And we have to underscore um, the importance that like these lands, these animals don't belong to any one individual or county commissioner. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, as we talked a little bit at, at dinner around public lands and conservation legacy in Montana, I think it's, you know, one of the things that was made plain in this last uh, legislative cycle is how as much as people love wildlife, we have to keep telling the story, um, and get as wonky as it can be, of the public trust and how that works and how state wildlife management has worked. Um, or, you know, the, op the, the, the two options are um, either you descend into kind of privatization of wildlife, or which is the other option, which is what we're seeing now is the pushback is towards, you know, federal control over, over wildlife, which some, you know, in some cases, folks may favor, in some cases, they may not. But those seems to be the the alternatives in terms of models that we have in front of us. Um, 
And speaking of models, another question here that is, this one's kind of informed by uh, Peter from Bozeman, um, one of our uh, participants tonight, is, you know, public lands um, are also an originally um, the traditional lands of our tribal nations here in Montana. And nations retain a lot of rights and interests to on those lands and or to fish and wildlife and to waters. And you know, there's been a lot of efforts in recent years, both at the federal level and at the state, such as with water compacts and agreements with the CSKT on um, kind of setting joint regulations and you know some of the efforts around bison management. Um, down in Yellowstone. I was wondering if you could just, you know, reflect for a little bit on terms of what you think if we should be collectively exploring um, different models and approaches when it comes to, you know, integrating tribal governments and voices more into management of those of those resources, and particularly of um, significant places like the Badger Two Medicine. I know that's federal, not state, but um, as we kind of think about the future of how we manage our public lands and resources here in Montana. Yeah, I, I think part of it is education, oddly enough. Like we had regular, um, for all state employees, the opportunity to first learn about um, trust responsibilities in the Native American cultures in uh, Montana. And you could be, you know, you could work as a clerk in the Department of Transportation, but you were invited because we all needed to. Stepping back, and I think I'd mentioned uh, to Lou that because of in Indian Ed for All, uh, when my oldest daughter was a sixth grader, she probably knew more about our tribal nations than I did by the time I graduated high school or even college uh, in Montana. But to the greater of integrating and ensuring, you know, it's we can celebrate that this week as an example, um, Secretary Holland signed the CSKT Water Compact. That was an ugly, brutal <laughs> process uh, that took it, you know, uh, caused a lot of gray hairs for a lot of people um, for years to get to that point. Now let's use that as a foundation to build off. When it comes to areas of cultural significance, one of the things that you all do, look, you talk about the importance of Badger to medicine. And we talk about these lands that are culturally significant uh, long before we were here. The more that we can institutionalize within government um, administratively, not even legislatively to get input. Like we got to the point in part, uh, Denise Juno was part of that, that any land state lands that the land board was dealing with, if it was gonna transfer through land banking or others, there'd be cultural surveys. So from that perspective, then a better understanding was institutionalized, no matter if the land was in Flathead County or in Macomb County, those steps would have to be taken, which then means it's effectively a consultation we do better when we provide some sort of consultative, consultative processes, I think. And, and, all, and along that line, do you see opportunities or um, in, in, regardless of the present administration um, to the ways that you can, the state could further integrate um, tribes in the management of shared resources as, as you started to do with with the example of Denise Juno and the land board that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it takes leadership. And I think that either we all collectively can insist upon it or we can make sure that the right people are there. I mean, when I left office, if you visited Helena right now, the flags for our tribal nations are right next to the US the POW and the Montana flag. And you could talk to some members of tribal councils even today who would say it wasn't that long ago that when we walked in that state house, we felt like we had to walk in the back door. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I appointed over a thousand different people to boards and commissions uh, every year as governor and tried to turn around and say, 
it's important to have Native Americans and others, not just on those commissions, those committees that deal with Native American issues, but I want them on the board of plumbers and pipe fitters because the more integrative in all facets that we have, the better off we are. But how to further institutionalize that, it takes one of two things. One, leadership, or two, people insisting upon making that occur. And you're looking at 7% of our population, 12% of our K-12 in our Native Americans. So they are a voting block that people ought to pay attention to. But more than that, it's such a significant part of the tapestry of what makes Montana that the better that we do, the better we are as a whole state. Mm -hmm. Another question here um, from the- I apologize, I kind of look dark and spooky too, that I don't have any lights in the living room of the place I'm staying, so. Um, we have a, uh, another question here from the audience, and this is from uh, Paulette. And she asks, uh, what do you think uh, we can do since you're out of office to help Montana continue to preserve um, open space and protect wildlife? And, and, and another person asks, like, in particular, are there ways you see that citizens or citizen groups right now, like where are the, like, the leverage points or opportunities to engage in the current political realities in our state that could be effective in, in achieving the same goals that Paulette just identified in terms of preser preserving open space and protecting wildlife. Yeah, I, I do think that the constant drumbeat of letters to the editor and making people aware um, are part of the overall environment that we need to create. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that in some respects, and that's a whole lot of people on this call and other organizations as well, that we were successful in enough when the <coughs> land transfer movement was really heating up of killing it so people all of a sudden didn't recognize that that threat hasn't gone away. So to be able to say, not in an alarmist way, but what the stakes are of the places that you like to hunt or hike or enjoy. Mm -hmm. And doing both from a coalition side, but the hard work is not just being coalition, but in our community. So speaking about what makes a town like Seeley Lake so special and or any of our towns and bringing people into the fold. I think that there are times that either the perception, which is unfair, of the conservation movement is that it's less inclusive. It's sort of like us against the world. Mm -hmm. Well, what we need to be doing is setting the table bigger every opportunity that we have. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm hearing you say, um, Governor, is that comes down to those daily kind of conversations that we're having with our neighbors, with our families, with our coworkers. Um, it's inviting people into that conversation. It's not just active in electioneering cycles or legislative cycles when the state legislature is meeting, but it's actually really doing the good hard work of kind of reseeding these values and reiterating them over and over again. Um, and so that and maybe that's what it is. It's leading with those kind of Montana values that we share and how important these lands are, important these wildlife are to our shared heritage and that they're not to be taken for granted. You know, I mean, I think this kind of leads into our next question. I had this experience this summer um, with some friends going down the middle fork of the Flathead uh, through the wild and scenic section, you know, a section of the river that was um, nearly dammed at Spruce Park in the 1960s, and which is an ins you know um, inspiration for the Craigheads to help lead to the passage of the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, but that was led by Frank Church of Idaho, um, back when some of our senators in the Western states were our leading champions of of wild nature. Um, and this friend I was with grew up in Montana, went to the public schools in Montana, uh, went to college in Montana. 
And we're standing there looking over the famous like last rapid in Spruce Park, right where they were going to build this dam. I mentioned to him the story that this was an area that was going to be dammed. And he'd never heard of it. Had yeah. no idea that this place where we were recreating could have been a place to be on a houseboat or something instead. And uh, Jerry from Great Falls asked, you know, what are we doing right now in terms of our public school curriculum um, to help students better understand this sort of conservation history and particularly the role of public lands? Um, she notes that we have classes on government and history and civics, but do we have classes on kind of this conservation history and policy or other ways of kind of helping people know this part of our story? Or what yeah. should we be doing? I guess I'll say three things on that uh, to Peter and Jerry. And first, I think that what you were saying before, it's both. Like we have to be vigilant during elections. Yeah. Um, and we have to double down. If 2020 didn't teach us anything in Montana, it's that elections do have consequences. And we have to make sure that people understand that. Now, it's also though that we can't just count on the policymakers that come to Helena. It really is building from, as you noted, it's the coffee shop conversations. It's other things every single step of the way, um, which is so critical. And to Jerry's point, um, it's not without challenge, right? Because look, you don't even have, so the wonky thing is the Board of Public Education sets the standards for what's required. And then you have local control within each individual school district. and. Boy, when I was trying to get us from two years of math to three as just a base requirement, you'd think I was trying to take over everything. But to infuse the opportunities in our educational systems um, where we can, it may not be a class on public lands, but it's a class on both Montana history and opportunities for outdoor recreation to work with our school districts and say, the treasures around Great Falls, Montana are a core part of our education. How do we better fold that in? Um, I don't think that the, there's any silver bullet when it comes to like our K-12 system, but in part to your example on uh, the Flathead too, that <clears throat> reminding people of what we have how it was preserved, the threat is still real, and that we could lose all of this. That's not political hyperbole, that's the realities we live in. Yeah, it is the realities we're living in. We're experiencing that in ways that I think a lot of us are quite surprised at the severity of the change of direction. I mean, it makes me kind of think of what is one of Newton's laws of physics, that for every reaction, there's an opposite and equal reaction, and it feels like um, at least if your theory earlier in the evening that we're somewhat victims of our own success uh, in terms of conservation of maintaining public lands and the recovering wildlife species, that that's a bit of what we're experiencing. And Roger and Kalispell wants to know what, you know, um, any insight you might have on how do we start to change the direction that Montana is going in terms of its, um, the trend lines from the recent election. Yeah. And Roger, I want to believe that um, 2020 was a little bit of an anomaly, to be honest. Um, look, people were dealing with incredible economic anxiety. They were dealing with the health anxiety of the global pandemic, and we had the Trump effect. Um, I had noted that I don't think through 2020, you know, I, for one, probably never had an opportunity to actually really even engage with voters that they saw me either taking away the rights or trying to protect them as an example. And it becomes the nationalization of it all becomes that much more greater, even down to the legislative level. Mm -hmm. But look, it won't change by just ruining it, right? That it takes work. <laughs> and it also <laughs> takes work of we can yell and scream, um, you know, if my wife was on this call, she'd say, I read the newspaper every morning, like during our legislative session, sometimes yelling, uh, sometimes with sorrow, sometimes maybe with 
a tinge of apathy only because it was like, hopefully this is what it takes for people to realize that elections really do have consequences. Mm -hmm. I think people have now realized, not just in conservation, in healthcare, in economic policy, uh, in wildlife, that this election did have consequences and we're seeing it borne out every single day. Now, what we have to do is be able to translate that frustration in ways that people whose lives don't wake, you know, they don't wake up every day worrying about Badger 2 medicine or other things, ways that they realize that this is a deeply personal assault on them too, to get them engaged. And we haven't lost Montana. Um, and we haven't lost those core values that we had before 2020. And we just have to remind people of what those values are and how to actually translate those values into action. Yeah. And on that, on that line, of, we have a question here um, that I think kind of gets at part of that, you know, process of translating, you know, those, those core values back into the state house and, and, and Helena is how do we encourage more young and and conservation-minded people to run for office, particularly, and this is from Colleen and Don in the Flathead in the Flathead Valley, but you could add in other more um, rural parts of the state as well. Yeah, you need to look to run for the state legislature and to win. That's a big sacrifice, right? That's ninety days out of every two years in committees and the pay ain't great. And I think when it comes to recruiting candidates, often it's the same people sitting around the table saying, how can we find what ends up almost the same individual? Like we have to be active people that we know in our community that might not have thought about run for office. We have to reach out to them and we have to talk to them about what's at stake. And Don and Colleen to your, Critical point. I mean, I think one of the reasons why we're seeing greater strides nationally when it comes to uh, dealing with climate change and some conservation, it's not my generation. It's the young are teaching the olders that we have to start taking action. So to try to both talk to them about what's at stake, but also talk to them and take that energy and that idealism and don't make it into absolutism, meaning that the only way to make change, right, is to get in the game, first of all, be frustrated at times, um, and not let the perfect be the enemy of the good every single time. Uh, but it's not easy talking people into that. Uh, you talk about the flathead. I mean, like Kyle Waterman, I think, is running um for the legislature talk about a great guy who he's run before brings incredible energy i think he's on the whitefish city council right now but then we also as a larger community have to both open up our checkbooks and open up our shoe leather and help out those folks that really can make a difference in running and more than making a difference in running can make a difference in serving mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that, um, you know, that part of the structure of the government too is part of that barrier that we have um, to getting people involved in the, the legislature. Uh, uh, you know, it's the, it, it demands such a commitment, but yet it's also such a small amount of time that it can't be a, a full-time or even a secondary kind of profession. Um, let's see, I got another question that came in here. Uh, and I want to see if I can try to answer this from Derek here in, in East Glacier. It's going back to kind of land, public lands management. It's a, it's a federally focused question, um, but uh, I hope you can offer some insight to it. And, and Derek asked, um, how much overlap do you think exists between management and policy of federally protected lands like national parks and future wilderness areas? Um, that we can use moving forward, specifically considering that the Native Act stipulates communications and relationships with cultural knowledge and tribes. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Native Act. I'm only, um, it's been a while since I've been familiar with it, but I think if I understand what Derek's asking, like how can we take what we're learning in terms of our current management models 
and apply that to future land management kind of designations or administrative policies that better incorporate um, the tribal nations into those management decisions. Yeah, and, and Derek, I don't have uh, the specifics. So for that, I apologize. But I think that that is one where um, administrative will and working with the administrations certainly matter. I mean, think about the stark nature of uh, the first time in our country's history that the Secretary of Interior is a First People and what opportunities that might afford uh, going forward. But I think where we do both on the federally protected lands and others is try to take the best models and encourage if we can't, um, if we don't have the right executive or right leaders at the time, but encourage uh, taking the best of the models, incorporating both at the state and the federal level. So. I know that was a little bit uh, obtuse, but progress comes through demonstrating what works, the difference it makes, and being persistent when um, the first six times the actions aren't taken. I'm just looking here, um, see if there's any other questions. Folks, if you'd like to ask a question for Steve, we're up against our, our time here, but we got time for just another one or two questions. So if you want to get them in, please do. Otherwise, um, just ask one more thing. And you know, what are you, you know, what are you looking to do now and 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 um, hoping to do to help continue this legacy that we have, particularly around public lands and wildlife in Montana? Um, for, for your children and others now that you're out of office? Yeah, uh, look, Montana will always be my home and this is where we're raising our kids and um, been doing a mix of things since being out of office, uh, but figuring out in part, an earlier question was about from the electoral side, um, look, we've got to make sure that uh, we don't lose, like the Montana doesn't become another Idaho. And that's not, meaning it's not just in two year cycles, it's the hard work every single day. So being engaged in that and where I can lend my voice. Um, I know that one of the things that term limits, I think are not a good idea for our state legislature, but for like a governor, eight years is long enough. Uh, both for the energy that it takes, but also people get sick of, you know, <laughs> no matter who it is at some point. So, so it's not that uh, I want to be out there shadow boxing every single day, but both supporting those that do and those organizations that do and recognizing that uh, we still have a lot of work to do to keep this place that was such a gift for me growing up a place that I want to make sure that my kids' kids could have uh, the same experience uh, to make sure that we don't lose that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, virtually. Um, I hope that you'll be able to join us in person sometime for the fall gathering and, and enjoy. It's really a, a fun party and a fun celebration. And it's just, uh, we thank you again for um, your time and your reminder of how um, important these places are to our shared heritage here in Montana, to our economic well-being and to our future, um, and how important, although you, you touch more on energy policy, but also how important they are to the resilience of our ecosystems and our communities as we deal with climate change, is having these large protected spaces. So thank you for challenging us to recommit um, to that effort. Um, both here in the Badger 2 Medicine and across the broader state, because it can be easy sometimes to get discouraged. Conservation is a, it's a hard struggle. The victories come, um, but sometimes they can be seen elusive and, and long between. And the same in, in politics. And we're all as part of a society, it's part of uh, our civic duty to be engaged in that, building that better collective future for everyone. So thank you for challenging us to do that, even in, in conditions that might seem um, less than, than rosy sometimes right now. So I know me for one that uh, I've been inspired by 
uh, what you've shared with us tonight, as I'm sure our, the rest of the group gathered here has been as well. So thank you, Governor, for joining us. And I wish you a wonderful time here in East Glacier with uh, your wife. And I wish your daughter the best with her volleyball season uh, still to come. Thanks, Peter. And more important, thank all of you both for joining tonight, but for your commitment to knowing that, as the vision says, there are places that we have to make sure the next generation can enjoy and will be protected and preserved. And um, it's a long struggle, but it's a critical struggle. So thanks for having me tonight. Enjoy. Yeah, thank, thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Steve, thank you so much for coming. We sure enjoyed it. You bet. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Bye now. And everyone else there with us tonight, um, please stay with us. We have a few more things still ahead of us tonight.